Hey, welcome back, everybody. Here we are not only at Chickamauga, but we are tying up our Chickamauga coverage, and man, what a place to do it. We are on Snodgrass Hill or Horseshoe Ridge. We might try to work out what in the world, where one ends and one begins, or how they overlap as we go. Um, but we're going to be talking about the September 20th fighting here at Chickamauga. I'm Gary Edelman. That's Chris White behind the camera, and you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We have some guests with us, as we always do. So just to summarize, we've already talked about September 18th when the Confederates push across uh, uh, Chickamauga Creek. We've already talked about the 19th, where the Union is really pushed into a tight defensive position. We've set up the 20th, where John Cable Breckenridge threatens the Union left, while James Longstreet pours through a gap about a mile, uh, about a mile or so behind the camera at the Brotherton Farm. So this is setting up a climax of the battle. The Union Army is cut um, into two, and what will happen? And what will happen? I think you know will climax here on Snog. Grass Hill and on Horseshoe Ridge. And to start to unpack this, and we're going to walk around some more, let's bring out Jim Ogden, historian here at the park. Well, thank you, Gary. And um, you know, today, um, uh, Snodgrass Hill or Horseshoe Ridge, most commonly amongst um, uh, folks recognized as Snodgrass Hill, um, is one of the principal um, places to visit, one of the principal landmarks um, on the, uh, the Chickamauga battlefield. Um, it gets that name Snodgrass Hill because the Snodgrass family farmed this um, eastern end of this wooded hill mass that juts out from the eastern side of Missionary Ridge. Um, but this whole wooded hill mass on which eventually a one mile long rallied Union line will be formed was really something that was not known at all by the majority of the participants on the battlefield until that late morning midday of September the 20th when as a result of the movement of Wood's division uh, that we heard about there on the Brotherton farm um, and the attack of James Longstreet left-wing uh, troops, the southern half of the Union line is put into a very fluid state and thousands of Union soldiers are being driven from their positions, some of them literally fleeing panic-stricken back towards Chattanooga and, um, and others simply looking for a place to fight. They are pushed into the woods beyond the large dire field just to the south of where we are right now. And all of a sudden, as they move into those, um, those, those woods, seemingly the ground begins to rise up in front of them. I know the camera doesn't fully capture the, um, the relief, the difference in the, uh, in the terrain, but if you look now behind me, you can see the ground um, uh, dropping down. Or maybe I should really say it the other way, since we, if we were Union soldiers, we'd be coming from the, uh, from the south, the ground suddenly rises up in front of them. And if you were one of those um, uh, re retreating Union soldiers or fleeing Union soldiers, um, and you've been driven from your position, you've looked back over your shoulder, and their line upon line of Confederates um, advancing towards you. And as you go into these woods, all of a sudden the ground rises steeply and sharply in front of you. You probably thought you'd have some, uh, a tough time um, uh, as well. And Union soldiers come um, up the, uh, the steep slopes of this wooded hill mass. Um, the, the whole uh, mass really more like a series of hills all pushed or smushed together. The Union troops will um, uh, struggle up to the uh, to the, uh, the top of the hill here, and you'd probably be huffing and puffing um, like they were if you did this today. Come and visit sometime. I'll take you on my Snodgrass Hill Fitness and Assault Walk, um, and the um, you'd reach the top of the hill, and you'd probably want to stop and catch your breath, and you'd look back to see how close the rebels were, and they're not right behind you. There are lots of details of this battle that we could get into, but there's been a brief counterattack in the big dire fields, which has slowed the Confederate uh, pursuit down. And this allows these men to stop and catch their breath. And for some of them, they look around and recognize how steeply and sharply this hill mass rises above the general lay of the land. And they say, we can fight from here. You've got a flag, wave the flag. You've got a bugle sound to the colors and a new Union line begins to form on this wooded hill mass. Uh, we're at, um, uh, at the top of um, what becomes in the Chickamauga historiography come, uh, called Hill Number One. 
Um, and you see monuments here uh, for several federal units that arrive up here largely in a fragmented um, uh, form. But there are also several units that arrive up here relatively intact. And these units begin to form uh, this new line. The, um, uh, you also have um, a, a number of um, officers and leaders who arrive up here and begin to encourage the, um, uh, the, the formation of this new line. And it is a line that is not perfectly straight. It's actually a line that has lots of bends and angles in it. In fact, as you walk the line and as you look at it more carefully, it really begins to appear to be a series of salients and re-entrant angles. And knolls like the one where we were just a moment ago, hill number one, um, those, the high points are typically the salients and the re-entrant angles are the low spots or saddles between the rises. And additionally, reinforcing this line are the guns of several artillery batteries, including Battery I of the 4th United States Artillery, positioned here um, and as you can even see, the guns here are firing down into one of those low areas, um, those, that draw or ravine or saddle between um, the rises. And for Confederates who um, will eventually attack this position, they're attacking into those re-entrant angles, getting fire from several places where we are along the line. I'm here where fragments of um, Negley's division, both from John Beatty's brigade and um, Timothy Stanley's brigade, where they are positioned, including some men from the 104th Illinois, who, to encourage themselves and their comrades around them, and to taunt the rebels in front of them, begin singing the battle cry of freedom. They're firing down into this low ground, and as the Confederates come up, the first Confederates being South Carolinians of Kershaw's brigade, as they, those Confederates come up, some will turn and attack up the slope directly towards us, and others um, will move through that low ground. And those uh, Confederates moving through that low ground are going to get fire into the flank of their, um, uh, of their line from these troops along the top of the um, of the hill here. Can I, uh, I am loath to break in, but I still will anyway, Jim, because I mean, you can almost picture it. We hope you watching can almost picture, you know, what Jim is describing here. Um, you don't need a grand understanding of this battle because that doesn't happen in one video or one week or one month or one year, okay? We encourage you to go to battlefields.org, watch our animated map of which we're putting some clips in here, pour through the maps and come to understand it. But more than anything, listen to videos like this, read the accounts of the soldiers, and I swear when you walk around here, you can almost picture it. The, um, uh, you might be able to detect we're going um, uh, down um, down slope right now. We're actually walking towards the um, uh, the Kirtledge, the, the core of the farmstead of George Washington Snodgrass's um, uh, farm here. Um, but we're walking along the Union line um, that uh, has, has been formed um, from rallied um, uh, fragments and also from a number of units that have arrived up here. Um, and with some integrity. The, um, uh, now, of course, George Thomas is going to get the, uh, the credit and the fame for, um, for this stand on Snodgrass Hill. It becomes known as the Rock of Chickamauga. Um, he'll arrive up here to find the, uh, the Union troops here have, ra um, have repulsed the first Confederate attack. And Thomas will take post here um, in the area of the Snodgrass Farmstead, just on the back slope of the hill there, and ride along the line at different times to encourage these men who have rallied and have made a, um, a, a stand. One, um, uh, one element of, um, of this new line that has, um, has been formed um, is an open spur that juts out um, on the eastern side um, to the east of the, uh, the Snodgrass Farmstead. You can see it lit up there in the sun behind me. The, um, uh, this open spur will be um, uh, a key position, and it will be the left of the line on Snodgrass Hill. The, um, uh, the buildings of the Snodgrass Farmstead begin to, um, to shelter wounded from, uh, from this action. 
Um, they'll be used for, uh, for medical treatment, um, becoming an impromptu field hospital. But if you remember from our Crawfish Springs video, the real field hospitals are located away from the battlefield. And care at a place like the Snodgrass Farmstead will be much more rudimentary. And we'll get back to that in a minute. We're going to go back to the house and talk a little bit about it. But as you um, look out along this, um, this open spur, um, you, here Union troops will, will be positioned. Um, in particular, the brigade under Charles Harker, one of the brigades of um, Thomas J. Wood's division, the division that was moved out of, um, of line. Um, when Harker's men um, are initially um, on the hill, number one, where we were, they're, when they're moved down here, Harker immediately realizes that to be on the crest of this open spur um, would be exposing his men. But he realized that the north side of the open spur um, drops down um, sharply as well. And he's able to literally use the open spur as a parapet um, uh, between his men and the, um, uh, and the, the Confederates. And he'll, his main position will be behind the crest. They'll advance up to the, uh, to the crest, fire down the slope in front of them, um, then retire to reload while another regiment does the, uh, the same thing, rotating one regiment after another up to the crest of the ridge. It is in this area just um, a little bit to our, um, or my right, where um, George Thomas is as he's watching this, um, this action develop, when one of his staff officers points to the north and um, uh, towards a large cloud of dust that is being driven into the air, indicating the arrival of some body of troops. Are they perhaps Confederates who are turning the left of the, uh, the Union line? Might they be Gordon Granger's Reserve Corps men who are up at Rossville Gap, who have discretionary orders to march to the sound of the guns if Granger feels um, necessary? Um, Thomas, uh, feeling anxious about the, uh, the situation, um, pulls out his um, spyglass and tries to look to see the identity of the troops that are causing that dust being driven into the, uh, to the air. Um, but his nervousness has been translated to his horse, and his horse is fidgeting and moving around as well. Uh, Thomas is seen by some of um, uh, the, his staff officers to have, um, have pulled at his beard, disorganizing his, um, his beard. Um, and the, um, he hands his spyglass to another staff officer saying, here, you will have to, um, to, to look to, uh, to see. Um, and they quickly, or they um, eventually send another staff officer forward and find that it is indeed Gordon Granger's Reserve Corps forces. Two brigades in particular, James Stedman's um, uh, division, Whitaker's and Mitchell's brigades, and they are marched down. Thomas originally is going to use them to fill the one half mile gap between the left of the rallied Snodgrass Hill line and the troops who are still around Kelly Field. But just at that moment, he learns of a threat to the right of the initial Snodgrass Hill line, and he orders Granger to move across the fields and into the woods and extend the, uh, the right of the Union line at a critical moment, making the Union line here on Snodgrass Hill one mile in, um, in length. That's the, this is the scene that is captured in the famous James Walker painting of the Battle of Chickamauga, the arrival of Granger's troops at that critical moment in the fighting here on Snodgrass Hill. Throughout the afternoon, this rallied Union line will repulse as many as 25 individual Confederate assaults, brigade size assaults. Multiple Confederate divisions are now facing this line, but with the loss of John Bell Hood, wounded in the fighting down in um, Dyer Field with Thomas Carmichael Heinemann um, uh, wounded um, and not fully controlling um, uh, his division any longer with, Jane, um, with Joseph Kershaw pinned down in a ravine at the base of Hill Number 1. Longstreet, who seemingly had a nice, neat, orderly formation um, in uh, mid-morning, now is really confronted with dealing with a situation where he's commanding the 17 individual brigades against the position that we're, uh, that we're uh, standing now, there'll be six separate Confederate assaults. First three by Kershaw's brigade, and then 
um, three by Archibald Gracie's brigade late in the afternoon. But this stand by Union troops on this Wooded Hill mass will allow George Thomas in late afternoon to begin a phased withdrawal, dropping back first one unit and then another from both the Snodgrass Hill line and the Kelly Field line to pass them northwestward through McFarland Gap and Missionary Ridge and back towards Chattanooga. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 as the last of the Union troops begin to withdraw, the Confederates finally achieve the coordination, cooperation, synchronization that they have needed all along over the last three days, and they launch an all-out full-scale assault and come forward to only essentially occupy the abandoned Union positions. They'll capture a couple of regiments here and around Kelly Field that hadn't gotten the orders proper to withdraw or who get caught, um, all, uh, pinched off in, um, in the, uh, the retreat and the uh, Confederate assault. Um, but the Union Army has basically withdrawn from the battlefield. And the Battle of Chickamauga will come to a close just as darkness settles over the field on the evening of September the 20th. Or had the Battle of Chickamauga only begun at that moment? For those who um, had participated in this fight, some of them for three days in some of the most horrific fighting um, of the war in this limited visibility forested environment, there are now all of the reminders of that difficult fighting. There are 28% uh, of the forces engaged. There are 25,000 wounded soldiers and the medical, per, uh, medical capability of both armies has been stressed by the sheer number of the wounded and the nature of the fighting. And there are hundreds, thousands of wounded soldiers immediately on the battlefield um, and needing um, care and attention. And there are many impromptu um, uh, the hospitals or field uh, medical uh, care facilities that have been set up including the one here at the Snodgrass Farmstead um, where soldiers using the, um, uh, the buildings for shelter, um, where they have sought shelter and the assistant surgeons and medical personnel who are available are trying to do the best that they can, uh, can care. And one of the, uh, the experts on Civil War medical um, uh, uh, treatment and processes is Dr. Hodges um, and he's looked at the, uh, the, the medical treatment here in the Battle of Chickamauga. As Jim said, there were 25,000 wounded men spread on this battlefield. It will take roughly two weeks to retrieve and treat all the wounded from the battlefield. Snodgrass here, House here actually doesn't function as a field hospital where there were operations done. This was more of an aid station where men were stabilized. They placed lint into wounds. That's a clotting mechanism. They placed splints on gunshot fractures. Essentially, they got the man ready to go to the field hospital. And that's what the Snodgrass cabin was used for. Most of the field hospitals for the Confederates were wherever their unit crossed Chickamauga Creek on the opposite side. The Union field hospitals water. Again, well, there's a water shortage. So the majority of the hospitals are south of us at Crawfish Springs. There are a couple north of us. Both of these sites are off the park. So this is where we choose to tell the medical story here. What is the most common battlefield operation? Amputation. It seems cruel by our standards today, but they really had no choice. This is in the pre-antibiotic area before they know of the knowledge of germ theory of disease. When they do an amputation, they are trying to prevent the gunshot wound. The, it becomes infected after 48 hours. It'll spread through your body. It can kill you. So essentially, they were trying to prevent that spread of infection. If a major gunshot wound went untreated for 48 hours, you died 90% of the time. I'm talking about a major wound where the bone is splintered or the joint is involved. If they amputated, you only statistically died 35% of the time. They are simply playing the odds when they do an amputation. If you had a major wound of the head, chest, or abdomen, where the bullet penetrates the bowels, penetrates the skull, 10% survival rate if they operate. 10% survival rate if they leave you alone. 
So essentially that's why arm and leg cases predominate. It's where they have the best success operating. You can imagine a surgeon goes into an abdominal wound, unsterile hands, unsterile instruments, the contents of the bowel spill, you have a microbiological disaster. So that's why arm and leg cases will predominate. And in one of, I think, the oddest statistics of the war, the vast majority of wounds occurred in the arms or legs. You would think aiming, you would hit the trunk of the body more evenly. These statistics come from a set of books the Army did after the war called The Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't believe that 70% of the wounds occurred in the arms or legs. But recently, I was able to purchase the casualty reports, the original casualty reports of the Reserve Corps of the Army of Cumberland. Came here at Snodgrass Hill. Many of those reports listed where the men were wounded. I thought, what a perfect random sample. 69% of the Reserve Corps' wounds were in the arms or legs. After that, I, belay, I believed what they wrote in the medical and surgical history. But that's the reason amputations predominate. They have a high survival rate, and that's where most men are wounded. Chris Bukowski of Emerging Civil War, and as we've been talking about Snodgrass Hill, I've been hiding out in the Snodgrass cabin. So I want to invite Anthony to come over here and show us how this place was used as a triage station during the battle. I've had a great time exploring, and thanks to Jim Ogden, we're going to have the chance to go behind the scenes in a little spot here at Chickamauga where most people don't get to explore. This, in fact, this is one of the sites uh, we would do interpretation for medical history. We would actually set this up to look like a field hospital. Now, this was the home of the uh, Snodgrass family. There are also other outbuildings that are no longer in existence. But typically, the man would be brought in when we used to interpret it here. We would use the Snodgrass farm table as our operating table. And that's very common in field hospitals. They used whatever they could find. Knock the doors off the hinges. Down at the Gordon Lee House, supposed the dining room table was used as an operating table. The man would be brought in and his wound would be examined. Now, the surgeon's favorite probe was his finger. He would simply take his unsterile finger, run it into the wound, and all he's trying to do is determine how much damage did the bullet do. If they couldn't find it with their finger, they had a little probe called the probe of Neloton. It was a piece of unglazed porcelain on a flexible wire. And they would run that down to the wound when that white porcelain hit a lead bullet, made a black mark. But again, he's trying to determine the extent of the damage. If the bone is not broken and the joint is not involved, they would not amputate. That was the criteria for amputation, is the bone splintered? Is the joint involved? If the answer was yes, that's when you did an amputation. As I said earlier, average survival rate for an amputation is 65%. Survival rate tip of the finger, 99%. Survival rate at the shoulder or the hip, where John Bell Hood was wounded, 10%. So Hood survived a was a uh, very low uh, survival rate on the operation that Hood underwent. There's one thing I know Chris Mikowski has a question for Jim, but let's pop out here and show you an image real quick because I can't resist. <laughs> and we hope you guys will like it because it's relevant to what we're doing today. So, yes, many of you like, you know, kind of like the American Heritage Maps. Checking out the park wayside exhibits at various parks are great. You get local and various national artists to do these things for you. So, when they were working on this particular one, I think, Dr. Hodges, you had something to do with this. Yes, this was actually done back in the 80s. You can tell it was done a long time ago. The outpost is the surgeon. The surgeon has black hair and it's been, gee, at least 20 years since my hair was black. These are some of the instruments that I set up, still in my collection. Have done this once, uh, I guess two years ago. I did it for an Army medical group. Uh, came up here, it was the last time that we have done any medical interpretation here at Snodgrass Hill. Here you have the exact casualty figures for those of you who uh, like exact numbers. One of the things is my hair's turned whiter. When I give numbers, they all start to round off to round figures. <laughs> <laughs> I'll also note that here uh, posing is, we believe at least, uh, uh, American Battlefield Trust Civil War Copey Hill fellow Daryl Black, Dr. Yes, Daryl Black. Yes, we think that's Daryl. And, and although it doesn't look like him, I think you'll be seeing him on one of our videos. That's Dr. now Dr. Todd Gross, Gross. Uh, of Georgia Historical Society uh, posing in that place. So we that's, wanted to show that off. Yeah. So thank you, Anthony. You're uh, welcome. Chris Mikowski. 
So as we've been talking about all the action here, I've been looking for William Ro uh, Rosecrans. I can't find him anywhere. Jim, where's Rosecrans? Well, Rosecrans got swept off of the battlefield by the collapse of the um, of the Union right. Um, along with Alexander McCook, the 20th Corps commander, and Tom Crittenden, the 21st Corps commander, they were swept into the hills of Missionary Ridge. Um, and, um, and in that process, um, Rosecrans will run into um, to his chief of staff. Now you might say, now wait a minute, um, how the heck did uh, the, the army commander and the chief of staff get, um, get separated? Well, as, uh, as one of the final testaments to just how fatigued and mentally exhausted Rosecrans was on the 20th, he had ridden away from his headquarters group in the midst of the disaster that began to, um, to unfold. And Rosecrans and Garfield will encounter one another and Rosecrans um, will uh, begin telling Garfield um, all the different things he wants done back in Chattanooga. Um, and while Rosecrans thought he would return to the battlefield, but those two men will change roles, Rosecrans will go back to, um, to Chattanooga to begin organizing a defense and the redirection of the Union supply line into Chattanooga. Garfield will return here to the battlefield um, and deliver Rosecrans' message to Thomas to withdraw the rest of the army from the, um, from the battlefield. Um, so Rosecrans is not on the Chickamauga battlefield at the end of the, um, of the battle. That is part of the story of, um, of how he becomes a um, uh, certainly less recognized um, uh, character in Civil War history, although I will raise the question, as a departmental commander, where at that moment could Rosecrans do more towards um, uh, re overcoming the difficulty that has beset his army here on Snodgrass Hill with George Thomas or back in Chattanooga where he has the telegraph to begin directing the movement of troops and supplies and other materiel to ensure the Union Army can continue to hold on to the city of Chattanooga. Great, Jim. You know, I have a lot more questions, but we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we appreciate everything that uh, you, Jim, and Dr. Hodges, and Dave Powell, and Chris and Chris have done for us here. We're going to pick up this story in Chattanooga, where maybe we'll even cover the retreat into Chattanooga, uh, the fortification, the plans to outbreak, Grant takes command, and the Battle of Chattanooga, approximately two months after the Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, from that location, we'll have another special guest there. Let me encourage you all to watch uh, uh, some of the videos we shot in 2018, namely the walk of Chris White, Dan Davis, and I up Snodgrass Hill. It's not just one slope, it's one, then another, then another. You always think you're there and, and you are not quite there. So watch that video, watch the others from that series, and get to know Chickamauga uh, a little bit better. Thank you all for watching and for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.